Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, PNR uh, broadly, uh, programs and resources, the folks uh, out at TSO Indianapolis, uh, folks out in Kansas City, Quantico, uh, for getting all the way out to the folks that we have, McNaffis out in Pendleton, uh, folks across the board. If we got folks dialing in from RPX at uh, some of our aviation sites, uh, you know, Yuma and Beaufort, uh, Miramar, all the way out to Iwakuni. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening. Ahoy um, Hey, it's, it's been a while uh, since I've been here in front of you. Uh, and it's a, a little mark of the, the time, I suppose, um, uh, the time of COVID and how it's uh, really colored uh, a little bit of everything uh, or a lot of everything, uh, depending on your own circumstances. So, um, you know, there are many people who've had uh, uh, challenges, life events, uh, good and bad, uh, during COVID that COVID affects. So COVID affects deaths in the family, funerals that cannot be had. Uh, it affects marriages um, uh, in terms of weddings. Uh, and uh, it, it can affect sometimes just uh, the, the wonderful events of the birth of a child. Uh, and so we've all had our circumstances and, uh, and, and my family has had ours. And, um, and so uh, I gotta tell you, it's very good to be back. As odd as this is, we've done a few of them and I uh, feel pretty comfortable in this virtual environment with you. Um, it's, uh, it is honestly and truly a pleasure uh, to be back uh, talking to you all today. And I wanted to start off a little bit talking about the fact that uh, I'm really pleased with uh, leadership across the Marine Corps. Um, you know, we, we really said that, you know, it's a people business, uh, it's a family if done well, and that uh, one of the most important things that we can do is to recognize the folks who are working uh, so hard, whether it be just by an enduring level of effort uh, a great idea, uh, a special project, uh, or even, and, and perhaps most importantly, a team. So one of the things that we said that we would do is, is find more ways and impactful ways to recognize people uh, through action, uh, through deed, uh, not just word. And we tried to, you know, find ways of doing that. And uh, I'd really like to thank the, the leadership, in particular, you know, the, the, the branch heads, uh, supervisors, leaders who took the time uh, to reach out and recognize folks. And uh, because it has been some time, there's a lot of folks uh, that have been recognized. So I will tell you, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's good for everybody, mostly for me, I suppose, uh, to have the opportunity to recognize people who are doing uh, really great work. Um, you know, given the time and the number of people who've been recognized, um, I think it would almost be counterproductive if I took the time to read through uh, the names of individuals and in, uh, on-the-spot impact awards or teams that have been recognized. So what we thought that we would do uh, to try to focus on, uh, you know, the, the positive uh, impacts, a positive energy, uh, and focus on that and not turn it into a chore uh, where we're, you know, after the first couple of names, it becomes just the reading of a list, uh, that we would try to, at least for you all publicly, to recognize, be able to recognize your teammates individually if you have the opportunity by, by listing out the people who have been recognized. Uh, and with a little snapshot, of the reason for which they, they have been recognized. I'd also like you to consider very positively, think about who those people's leaders are, uh, their branch heads, their supervisors, their directors. Think about the people who took the time to put them in uh, for recognition, to recognize the good work uh, that they're doing. And, and I'd ask you also uh, to recognize the circumstances uh, under which this has happened. So, I mean, we're all still trying to I mean, after all this time, it seems like about 100 years, um, still working through processes and trying to understand the best ways to maximize uh, participation, to, to, to meet the mission, 
uh, to try to you know, do things efficiently and effectively as we can from this uh, very highly, very, very highly distributed environment. Uh, so, um, you, know, you know, please consider that. Along those lines, you know, we said in here, in this environment, would be better with a full auditorium here. And, uh, you know, perhaps, I don't know if, you know, Indianapolis is still going through the, you know, the practice of going over to the, the war memorial there and gathering as a group and so forth and how it's done and other smaller geographically separated locations, uh, but to, to, to recognize people, you know, on a more itinerant basis. And so we, uh, not only for performance, uh, but for achievements in terms of uh, promotions, uh, and uh, in, in other life events. So likewise, we have a list of a whole host of Marines in here who have been selected for promotion. Um, you know, one of the most uh, rewarding things for all of us, whether, you know, whether, uh, you know, in uniform or out, uh, but a sign of advancement, a sign of the recognition of our past performance, and really the sign of, most importantly, of our potential uh, for future leadership and responsibility. So. Likewise, there's a whole host. I mean, there's three pages, four pages uh, of, uh, of, you know, promotions in there as well. And then we have a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of life events here in terms of, you know, welcomes to the family. And, uh, you know, because this is out, you know, over the internet, I won't, I won't read the names out of respect for people's, you know, personal information. And, the, you know, folks, we generally check to see if it's okay with them if we put something out you know, emails and so forth. But I ask you to look, and we've had some, you know, some, uh, uh, some new members of the family arrive in the world here. So I'd ask you to, you know, consider that. And again, consider that here in, in, in the time of, uh, uh, of COVID. So I think they got, uh, you know, there's a Sarah McLaughlin so song about ordinary miracles that kind of seems to resonate uh, lately. So, um, so there is that. Uh, I, I thought it really important to, to start off with that, the most important thing, which is really you um, and the things that you do to contribute uh, to the Marine Corps and what it is that we're trying to do. And I'll talk about that here in, in just one second, uh, kind of where we're at, where we're headed. But I would like to talk a little bit, as we must, uh, about where we're at with uh, COVID. Uh, and just very quickly, to say this, um, you know, we track all of the, you know, we've got, you know, Mr. Levy and his folks have done a wonderful job uh, of, you know, kind of mapping out, and we've talked about this before, all the trend lines uh, for all of the areas in which we have uh, PNR teammates, whether it be TSO or, again, Kansas City across the board. Um, and we've all seen, you, you, you pick it up generally in the news, but it's uh, very impactful to see it uh, in a simple uh, trend-lined uh, bar graph. Uh, but the numbers are coming down uh, significantly. Uh, but I would like to just remind everybody, you know, to, to, to stick with it here. Um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns out there, unknown variants. Uh, I think it's pretty. It's a pretty good news story. It appears the the uh, some of the data that's coming back out about uh, some of the um, some of the different types of uh, immunizations and the the actual effectiveness uh, as opposed to in the lab effectiveness. I know Israel's come out with a study. The UK's come out with a study. I think we're starting to see studies coming out of the U.S. and it's all very hopeful. And I, and I got to tell you, nobody wants to get there sooner than me. It's uh, I was walking around today as we were walking through the Pentagon and it just occurred to me that, you know, there's just patterns you don't see here anymore. You just, in, in a couple of things and you miss, I mean, one is just the people in the passageway. I mean, there's days that here, it's like the day the earth stood still, you know, you look around, you can look down, you know, get at one, you know, an apex and you can look down two long uh, uh, passageways and see not a soul. It's, uh, it can be unnerving sometimes when you can, you know, look in four different directions and see nobody. But you kind of miss all of the, the uh, Pentagon tours, you know, the backwards walking soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are backwards walking with their memorized shticks on, you know, telling everybody about this, you know, all the neat stories about the Pentagon and the when and the how and the why and, and all that stuff. And, and you don't see families here, you know, families coming to visit, families coming for promotions, families coming for lunch. Um, so uh, really looking forward to getting back 
uh, to those patterns. But, there's, uh, but we're not there yet uh, is the only point, and not meaning to be a downer. I'm just saying that, you know, hey, you know just be smart. I'll say be sm safe, but be smart. And, uh, and, you know, you're never in there till you're in there, you know, you never, you know, never declare victory early. Don't spike the ball at the five-yard line, all those kinds of things. So let's just kind of keep going. Okay. So uh, where are we at? Um, so, you know, in, uh, in PNR, we tend to, you know, bucket our efforts in, in pretty predictable ways. And a lot of them have to do with one of the, uh, the primary big wheels about the national security uh, decision-making cycle, right? And that's the PPBE, and we've said the PPBEA. So, you know, we'll go over, hey, where are we at? And we kind of just work through it temporally. You know, so you can talk about, we'll get into talking about the previous year as we get better about analyzing it. Uh, so there's work ongoing within PA and E to try and analyze FY20. Hey, what, wh where did we really spend the money, and how did that look relative to how we budgeted? How did that look like relative to how we programmed? How did that look relative to the plan? But I can tell you right now, we've got very unique aspects of FY21. Stacked on top of that is a relook at the budget for FY22, because there's a new administration, nothing unusual about that. New administration gets in and they say, hold on, on the budget, you know, we'll submit it a little bit later than the constitutional stipulates per se, they're allowed to do it, and, uh, and to make sure that administration priority is in there. POM 23, uh, which is, you know, kind of in a uh, critically important mode or modes uh, relative to resourcing the commandants force design, we'll talk about that, and the things that we're trying to do for reform. We're already talking POM 24 uh, in the context of 23, all stacked on top of each other. And that's not taking into account audit. Uh, audit where there's, you know, we're really, nobody can pressurize ourselves more than us. That's the beauty about the Marine Corps. You'd say, oh, there's a lot of political pressure to get an audit, but there's nothing that a politician can do to pressurize the Marine Corps to get an audit opinion more than we're going to pressurize ourselves because we're Marines. So, but there's, there's pressure there that, from us. Uh, and then there's a lot of pressure relative to uh, the transition from Sabres uh, our financial management accounting platform into the uh, 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 defense agency initiative, the DAI uh, platform that's more of a, a business mission system, uh, broader than a financial management accounting platform, taking into account a lot more things, a lot more cap. But, you know, there's, we're on a clock for that. And, and a lot of these clocks lead towards uh, really late summer, uh, early fall. They continue on out past that, uh, absolutely no question. And then, and then there's a lot of efforts uh, going on uh, across the board for a lot of the things that we're trying to do for uh, our uh, reform efforts for PPBEA, whether it be a uh, Marine Corps strategic assessment uh, in May for POM 24, these commanders organizational risk estimates that uh, BCG is helping us develop. We're going into wave two on that. We just had the meeting with all the commanding generals on that uh, this morning. A uh, big level of effort to try and uh, uh, get that set. Um, to go through a, an integration phase between planning and planning programming, which we laid out. It said we want to have more sessions with the Commandant. We're actually doing that. All of this is, oh, by the way, actually happening. The things that we all talked about, we all kind of envisioned uh, probably two years ago, uh, I'm happy to report are actually happening. Um, and they're all happening at the same time. So that's kind of the big news. But uh, so let me touch base on some of those things quickly. I'll talk a little bit of the, the context, uh, maybe a few other things, and then, and then take your questions. So I'll just go kind of in order. Uh, like I said, we'd really like to have a better understanding. We'll take the first turn on the A part of PPBEA, and that's the assessment. And that really start, should start you know, at, when, when closeout is finished in the three to six, three, and then another three weeks, whatever, but it takes to actually kind of close out. Is that about right, Mr. Gardner? And uh, after a 30 September, you get into somewhere in uh, early November where you go, the money settles and you go, okay, hey, this is what we're 
submitting to DFAS? Am I getting all this right? And we sign off, and I'm getting only a half-hearted yes. So I only got that part right. But uh, but at any rate, we're kind of signing that off, and and uh, and then we can analyze to see where the money went. So there's that. FY21. FY21 right now. Uh, a whole host of things going on again simultaneously because when we transition out of the current uh, continuing resolution into an enacted budget and took all those marks and everything puts and takes Congress, you know, we lay that in to the budget, which means that money's moving around and now we have people who are less happy than they were less happy before. <laughs> and uh, you start moving the, the money around at the very time where you're starting to see where the money isn't and start to aggregate uh, your demand signals in a mid-year review kind of framework uh, in seeing where the money is under executing funds and all that kind of stuff. So we're working really hard, but the news on, so that's all standard, right? All standard. But normally, the way the timeline goes is that we would do a mid-year review really kind of in March. We just put out the guidance for that, and then you would submit that all the way up and then over to Congress in the you know, May time frame, maybe June get the money in August, maybe September. Well, we're doing a, a reprogramming in March. So we're doing a bunch of stuff right now and trying to organize ourselves to take advantage, best advantage of the commandant's money for the commandant uh, and try to get that lined out uh, all right now and get that you know, socialized through the Department of the Navy and then up to uh, OSD and so forth. But it's a pretty, I mean, we're trying to figure this out pretty fast uh, along a timeline that's compressed by at least uh, two months, but we're doing it. And I think we got a pretty good plan. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't leave a bunch of uh, military personnel money, MILPERS on the table like we have for a number of years past, so we're gonna take advantage of an asset there. And so that's kind of 21. So I really, you know, uh, thanks to all the budget and execution folks out there who are really working hard on that. And, you know, Tom Osterhout, you know, Colonel uh, Gary Roch, you know, Denny Martino, uh, you know, we've got the folks, uh, uh, you know, Major Rogers doing, uh, you know, a lot of the MILPERS stuff, Eddie Pagan trying to sort out all the uh, investments. So I really appreciate all the work to try and figure that out because we're kind of doing sort of that same thing for 22. So the budget should have been submitted to Congress in February. Every new administration comes in, and like I said, and so now we're trying to go, okay, based on 21 and based on 23, and things that we know now that we didn't know when we put the budget together, what are the demand signals uh, since OSD and really the White House asked uh, with their folks uh, in here now, SEC, SEC defs in here, depth SEC defs in here, confirmed and in, the, in their seats in the office and so forth. Um, what are some things that you would want to do to change your budget if you could? Uh, so we're looking at a bunch of things that we had marked against us, whether it be fuel charges or foreign currency fluctuation, all these kinds of things to, um, you know, what, what me, we might want to do to lay in more sustaining levels of resources for audit or even things that are flowing backwards out of Palm 23 for MROCs that we've already had to include demand signals from TCOM that they think they need more military structure for our ranges and some of our locations, our learning centers and all these to improve our, uh, and kind of right size our training education environment in support of the Commandant and his force design. So those questions are all being asked right now as we go into uh, a bunch of deliberate examinations of some things that the uh, new administration wants to take a look at decisions made prior to them uh, getting in here. So they want to look at shipbuilding. They want to look at uh, nuclear modernization. Uh, they want to look at decisions made on aircraft, whether it be F-35s or tankers, the new KC-46 tanker, whether it be, you know, uh, MQ-9s and, you know, how many orbits around the planet, you know, supported primarily in Senate, all that kind of stuff. So that's all, you know, really layered on, uh, on top and, and really, uh, that's, that's much more expansive. I really appreciate the work that uh, RPM is doing uh, on that. Uh, so, you know, R you know Rick Cruz uh, out of the engine room, our you know, kind of subordinate engine room is really doing uh, great work. But uh, across the Marine Corps, really, it's not just simply a budget review. There's a lot of programmatics in that. Uh, so we're working on that. While they're working, putting issue teams together uh, for the strategic portfolio reviews, 
uh, for Palm 23. So as you can see, 21 stacked by 22 in the ways that normally does not happen and then stacked by 23 because of you know, what we've done with our reform efforts and you know, sessions with the Commandant and then stacked with 24 because we're already uh, starting to talk about that. Really kind of pressurizing. Um, I gotta tell you, really appreciate, uh, again, Jennifer Bumer and her leadership of uh, DAI and all the folks that are working hard on that. I know Colonel Gary Roch has uh, personally committed himself to that and a bunch of you people are working on that uh, to really great ends because that, that is a, a heavy lift. Um, you know, there's areas right now that we're looking in terms of, uh, you know, constant, you know, kind of, it kind of goes in waves in terms of concerns about uh, interfaces and how that's all going and getting past, uh, you know, how we're handling big tranches of data in ways that they haven't had to before. And, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal. And, you know, it's a big deal when you have a, you know, a service uh, level enterprise. I mean, we, it's somebody else's. Uh, program, but we decided to do it. But it's really being driven hard uh, in partnership with us uh, out of the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense. And uh, you know, Mr. Greg Little is really a good partner there. And then we have folks out of the Department of the Navy really uh, helping out. So, you know, we're looking to implement that uh, in FY22. And so going hot on it in 22, and then I think we it's mature by J July or something like that in actual. Uh, uh, July of FY 22, calendar year 22. So uh, lots and lots of work and very grateful for that. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, grateful for uh, Jen, for your steady leadership uh, and you know, real steady hand on that. It's been, uh, it's going really well. And then uh, audit. Um, I could not be happier about where we're at with audit. And not sure I would have said that about uh, an hour ago. <laughs> We just had a really good meeting with uh, uh, the, uh, the lead for Ernst & Young, uh, the independent public accountant, Mr. John Short, who's phenomenal, by the way. Uh, he, he, he was an uh, enlisted soldier, you know, when he was a young man, and uh, then uh, he made his way into what he's doing now, and he's doing very well for, uh, by himself. Thank you very much at uh, Ernst & Young, and, and now the lead for our audit efforts. But, you know, he talks like a Marine. Uh, he acts like a Marine. He's just really biased uh, for action. I'm not going to say he's aggressive because he can't be. He's a, he's a certified public accountant. He's got to watch out for his license. But, uh, but he's really biased for action. And they've got a very uh, adaptive way of approaching sampling and testing and all that stuff for audit uh, using, get wait for it, data. Hey, and letting data cue you and be much smarter about how they're doing their approach. Uh, so very pleased with that. Very pleased with General Sharati, Ms. D. Reardon, and their team. Um, very circumspect about, you know, what's in the realm of, but at any rate, we had a really great meeting. So that's kind of audit right now is, you know, your, uh, um, your, your thoughts about where you're at on audit kind of ebbs and flows as well. And uh, so what I've told the team is, is, hey, I don't, I don't want you all worried about whether or not, you know, we're going to get an audit opinion. You know, that's really on me. So, um, uh, so really happy with where we're, we're headed uh, with that. So I think, you know, those are some of the big, uh, really big rocks. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm really, um, I'm really pleased with where we're at with some of the uh, knowledge management pieces that uh, continue to advance. Uh, I really, you know, thank the folks who started it, who really got us going. Uh, you know, Mr. Dave Skosik and all the folks who, who worked on that, you know, the partnership, uh, you know, now with uh, Captain Jenny Bologno, who's uh, really uh, working, uh, uh, you know, some of how we're trying to take advantage of the work that's been done for knowledge management, information management, and take advantage of, uh, of teams uh, and, and work our way uh, into something where, you know, we communicate better, faster, more completely, uh, and really, uh, quite frankly, be able to take advantage of our, uh, of our own information, to be able to get at uh, products, get at insights that were previously created that we shouldn't have to keep rebuying through work and analysis the same insights over and over and over again, which we've all seen in the Pentagon, constantly reinventing the wheel and reengineering the same information sometimes over and over and over again. So I think, uh, you know, lots of other work going on. We're going to have an FM summit. Uh, Major Moore's really excited about that. His face lights up every time he talks about it. 
but uh, that's going to be a big deal, I think, uh, for the Marine Corps. Um, and, and we just really want to, you know, a PNR oversees the financial management community uh, for the Marine Corps, you know, Marines and, and civilians alike. And there's a lot of exciting stuff to talk about it. We just talked about a lot of it here. I'm not going to go over it, but uh, really excited about that. Um, there's folks who are really excited about setting up a, uh, uh, a headquarters Marine Corps comptroller to kind of clean that up. We want to get uh, some of the, you know, headquarters Marine Corps non-discretionary budget items off of our, the P&R budget, uh, but more importantly, we want to work as a team. So there's a lot of great work done there. Blue dollar transformation, looking at that. There's a lot of synchronization efforts going on with respect to how we understand Congress and their RFIs and their our briefs to them and, and so forth. So um, I think that's probably, probably some of the big picture stuff I will men mention because we kind of oversee a little bit uh, participation as a kind of a third party uh, neutral, so to speak, is uh, Marine Corps Community Services and, uh, you know, a lot of great work uh, being done there. So um, I really appreciate the leadership out at Indianapolis. Um, you know, really done a, a phenomenal job of managing through a whole host of issues. I appreciate, uh, uh, you know, Tony Pretty and Kathy Maloney and, and really the communication that you've had in terms of your people uh, and how they are doing and how you're taking care of them. Uh, in notifications and so forth for a whole host of reasons. So really appreciate that. Uh, know that we're all going through a lot, you know, even out at, uh, you know, Kansas City and, uh, you know, weather and COVID and so forth. So across the board, I, I really appreciate it. Um, Ed, is there anything else that you think I ought to talk about? Okay. Okay. Michael, anything else? We have a couple of questions okay. in the Q&A, sir. Okay. Over to, over to Q&A. Okay, yes, sir. First question is, has there been any a decision on uh, changes to telework for looking at the post-pandemic cycle? Uh, changes to about decisions for telework post-pandemic. Uh, I'd say uh, clearly the answer is no. Like, we haven't set policies. Um, I think, uh, I think what, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, because uh, it's a really good question, is I think we are going to need to sit down and, and have conversations with leadership about, you know, uh, taking a look at what, you know, what works well, uh, how to best take advantage of that, and, uh, you know, where some of the limits may be uh, relative to communication, uh, participation, uh, and those types of things. Um, I don't know, Michael, is there anything else you think that people may be interested specifically in hearing about? Well, the distributed work environment, OPT, continues. I know that the presentations have been made uh, to DIMIX and above, um, but there's not been a decision at this point that I'm aware of. Yeah. Uh, no, there hasn't. Um, and uh, so I need to get, I need to get caught up on, on where they're at because it's been a while since I've seen, I've had a touch on that. So I'm glad you, I'm, whoever asked the question, I really appreciate it. Uh, because, uh, you know, I'd like to, I know it's, you know, briefs already, there's an OPT, but uh, senior leadership in the headquarters of Marine Corps, I can tell you, have not, we have not been engaged, meaning both uh, passively and aggressively. Like, we haven't been present in it, but neither has anybody engaged us uh, for our perspective on that. Uh, so I'll reach out to Major General Olson and uh, the director of the Marine Corps staff, just see where we're at on that, and at least see what the timelines are for decision. If you could Remind me, please, to get back out. I'll personally send an email back out to the team because that's a good question and people are very interested in it and uh, deserve an answer, at least where we're at in the decision-making process. Does that sound fair? Yes, sir. Okay. Next question is, is there any additional or new information uh, regarding the possible move uh, to the DFAS building, it's TSO? Uh, no, and I think that's something, this uh, TSO moving to the DFAS building at uh, uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison there in Indianapolis. Uh, so I think the answer is no. I think the, uh, the decision. Uh, so I was just talking with Mr. Gardner about that. Uh, I don't know, Ed, was it yesterday or <laughs> what day is it? The, uh, so we were just talking about that, and um, I think the near-term uh, concern for me is, 
because there is an expectation of greater telework and what we've seen, especially with the you know, TSO workforce, uh, that my near-term desire is to understand what the possibility is for scaling down after just scaling up in the new contract. Uh, but just take a look at how we might right size in the near term. But um, we need to revisit uh, where we're at in that decision. So I think the, uh, there's two pieces of that decision point. Uh, one is, does it make sense standing on its own merit? And then the other one is, does it make sense relative to the uh, estimated moving cost? So if it costs $8 million to move from you know, downtown Indy to the north side into the DFAS building, what's the break-even point on $8 million relative to the marginal cost savings per square foot uh, kind of thing, comparing the two locations? And then you got to do the qualitative thing, too. You know, so how does the, uh, what's the name of that building? What's the name of the building? The Bean Building. So the Bean Building in uh, uh, the DFAS Bean Building is, you know, what's the layout? There's been some, you know, initially prior to COVID, there was some concern about it not being kind of a, a unitary place, not having integrity for the workspace, just kind of, you know, you know, TSO members kind of spread throughout the building. With COVID, you kind of go, wow, does that matter? I don't know. I mean, we're doing all this distributed anyway, so I don't know. Um, but what I do know is I've lost uh, track of what the where the decision point is. So do we need to decide uh, today, next week, next month, sometime in the fall? I don't know. So um, we have been talking about that. It's been part of our conversation. Uh, but again, uh, I think we need to revisit that with the, with the leadership team and at least understand where we're at with respect to a decision space and, and then make near-term, mid-term, long-term decisions. Hope that helped. Sir, the next one. Uh, can you speak to the uh, COVID vaccination plan in the Pentagon with respect to how vaccinations are distributed and expected timeframes? Um, I have some information if you don't. Uh, I'll take it from a kind of a personal perspective and how I, I understand through my own um, experience since I have received the jab, as the Commonwealth people would say. Um, uh, so the, the vaccination. So, you know, my folks, you know, I think it was Major Moore came to me and said, hey, uh, do you want to get the vaccination? And I said, well, no, I'd, I'd, you know, you're a Marine. You're like, I'd prefer other people get it first. I mean, I... I I took it. I don't have any problem with the vaccination. If if you do, that's you know personal thing, and you know that's you know, people are dealing with that right now, and how we handle that, especially with operational operational units. Um, but then, you know, he helped me. Major Moore helped me understand. Well, hey, there's actually a framework there, uh, in a framework uh, in terms of uh, you know people who are mission critical all the time. Uh, and I'll probably get this wrong, you can correct me, so I'll apologize up front if I get this wrong, he will correct me. But uh, uh, so you get people who are working in the National Military Command Center, uh, for example. Uh, and then you kind of take it down. I mean, I I'm in like category 3A, which means anybody who is in a continuation of operations status, meaning if something bad happens to the Pentagon, Either it's just, you know, the power fails for a long time, no malice or something other, you know, bad actor thing. Um, then people go to alternate locations, and uh, I and other people on the PNR team are on that list, so that puts us in category 3A. Uh, so all I can tell you is I know there's a framework. I know that we're working really hard to adhere to that, to not make it a matter of preference uh, about uh, when you go, but to simply go when it's your term relative to uh, the priorities. And uh, uh, Michael, can you uh, fill the, in the gaps there? Yes, sir. A couple of other details. That's correct. There's there's a schema for all personnel, and you fit in some place in the schema, one A B, one C, two, three, three A B, etc. Um, and and broad, broadly and generally, you're right, there's the high priority individuals such as yourself who are critical to keeping the Marine Corps operating. Um, high risk individuals are, of course, very high on the priority list for getting vaccinations. Uh, then we have other high priority uh, uh, personnel and then the, the general population, if you want to think of it in those terms. Um, in terms of 
what's practically happening boots on the ground is there is some limited number of vaccines available distributed and allotted to PNR each week. We don't typically get a lot of advance notice for them, but we uh, maintain the list in M&P and we immediately uh, notify those personnel and check on their availability and see if they can make it. Because uh, as you know, once the In accordance with the schema. In accordance with the schema. Yeah. Because uh, there's a limited amount of time that the uh, vaccine is viable once thawed. So we try to make sure that uh, we don't waste any and we'll run through the list based on the schema and ensure that we use every one of the shots allotted to us each week. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was kind of funny when we went down there to, to get the shot. They had the first wave that had uh, come through the Pentagon just in terms of delivery was uh, Pfizer. And then the second wave was uh, Moderna. So the, the Marines were the first to get the Moderna. So the, the rumor was going around that they're, they're only giving <laughs> Moderna to Marines. What the hell is that supposed to mean? So we just started shouting that it was a conspiracy theory and moved on. Um, the fact of the matter is it, doesn't, it obviously doesn't matter. It's, you know, in, in nowhere in our history uh, at least I can recall growing up, what I have ever known the brand name of, you know, you know, I think as a, uh, you know, I can rightfully claim that if I've done, you know, nine overseas deployments and then been additionally been stationed overseas twice, that I've probably been jabbed as much or more than anybody else, but never once could I quote you who manufactured any of those. So we're just grateful to have them, whatever the brand is, uh, and grateful to, uh, to be able to move us past. What I'd ask, uh, Michael, is let's take a look as long as there's nothing uh, sensitive in anything we send out. Maybe we just send out to the team that that schema, that priority. priority. I'm sure it's already been out there, but maybe because somebody asked, we could send it back out if it hasn't yes, already. Sir. Yes, okay. sir. We'll, we'll resend it. Okay, thanks. Anything else? No, sir. Okay. You, you, do you all have any questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, Ed, anything else we ought to talk about? Okay. All right, well, I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and wrap it up from here. Those were, uh, um, those were three uh, good questions. Um, uh, the questions here, I gotta tell you, have really picked up over time. So I really do appreciate the engagement. Um, I hope you uh, had no problems dialing in and that uh, it all worked pretty well. Uh, we'll see if we can't get some feedback on that. But I'll just wrap by saying that, uh, you know, I'm really uh, grateful for a lot of things uh, given all the perspective that's going on uh, in all of our lives, uh, nonetheless, mine personally. Um, and right at the top of that list, I'm really grateful for you all. Uh, I don't think we, uh, we should forget about the fact that, you know, we've, been, we've all been working in one way or the other throughout this entire thing uh, because uh, you can say mission critical, mission essential, uh, but hey, this is, uh, this is the backbone of defense. Uh, for this great nation. And so I really do sincerely appreciate the way that you've all uh, worked together as a team, try to fight your way through all the comm. You're always fighting your way through comm, always, whether it's uh, at home, in the Pentagon, you know, out in operational environments, is fighting comm, fighting your way through it. So I appreciate that you have, and thanks for all the great work that's uh, reflected. I would, you know, just take some time, if you could. I mean, it, it'll take you a whopping one minute and 45 seconds, but just kind of flip through and reflect on some of the names in there, even if you don't know them and appreciate all the good work that people have done. You know, say a prayer for the, you know, the people who right now are afflicted with COVID and other things that uh, make, uh, that, you know, COVID has made very challenging. You know, be grateful for, you know, uh, uh, ordinary miracles and, and, uh, and, and thanks. Really appreciate it. Semper Fi.